Um, hello, everybody. Um, this is Jeff Davis. Um, going to talk about, going to do a webinar and talk about Agile um, and Scrum and uh, how that interacts with IEC 62443 cybersecurity standard in industrial automation control systems. So that's going to be the uh, subject of our topic today. Again, uh, my name is Jeff Davis. Uh, here's uh, my email address. If you end up with any questions or any comments, you can email me and uh, give me some feedback or ask some questions, or I can get you in contact with other people that might be able to answer other kinds of questions that you may have. So uh, this webinar is an introduction to the use of the IEC 62443 cybersecurity standards in an Agile framework, and um, basically I've picked Scrum to use as an Agile framework since a lot of people seem to either use it or are interested in using it. Um, it assumes that there's a little to no understanding really of IEC 62443, uh, so I'll talk about that at the 10,000 foot level, you know, very high level. Um, but there is some understanding of Agile, and again, most likely through some framework such as uh, Scrum. A little bit about myself, um, I've been uh, in the industry for uh, the software industry and um, telecom and process control uh, for a long time. Uh, so I have a lot of varied experience with different development systems, different development life cycles, different technologies, and um, different kinds of ways of approaching different architectures and designs and implementations. A little bit about Exida. It's a customer-focused com company. Um, we try to uh, help our customers achieve safe and reliable solutions um, through uh, powerful lifecycle tools. Um, we have certification and assessment schemes. Um, the certifications are both um, individual and company or process certifications. We have uh, lifecycle services that help uh, you with uh, experts to uh, help you in particular problems that you may have within a uh, section of the life cycle that goes forward. So we essentially have some enterprise tools, certifications and assessments, and uh, life cycle services. Um, reference materials, we have authored most of the process industry reference materials. Um, we have on a automation safety. We have reliability and security reference materials. We have data handbooks on equipment failure data. We also uh, have functional safety uh, books and uh, pamphlets and things that are uh, available for uh, use. A little more about our certifications. We um, are the industry leader in certifications for personnel, products, and systems, and processes. We do 61508, 61511, 26262, which is automotive, 62443, which is cyber. We do machinery safety certification, as well as personal certification, such as certified functional safety expert and certified automation cybersecurity expert or practitioner. In uh, functional safety certification, we're uh, one of the leaders. Um, we are the leader, actually. In uh, 2015, showed that we were the leader in uh, safety device certifications. Um, and we've also become the leader in the safety logic solver certifications. Um, so that is uh, one of the things that uh, we provide. In cybersecurity certification, which is uh, a lot, something that's come up lately, um, we also pioneered the cybersecurity standards. We have people who are on the standards committees for cybersecurity as well as safety. And we are also the uh, leader in providing cybersecurity certifications. We also have a number of tools that can be used. Uh, to help in both safety and cybersecurity. Um, Excellent is the software suite, and uh, it is made up of a number of different uh, tools that handle the different kinds of uh, things like alarms, um, process hazards, uh, assessments, et cetera, et cetera. 
they all interact together. So um, there's a life cycle integration, and you can see as we start the process hazard analysis, layer protection analysis, and as you run through the life cycle cost estimator, all the way through alarm rationalization and life event recorders. So it's a seamless flow of data throughout your product, or project rather, um, eliminates duplicate data entry and institutionalized corporate knowledge. And this is through the use of the data core. And the idea of the data core is to allow all of the access configuration database project and tool information to be shared amongst the different tools. We also provide OEM engineering tools. We have ArcX and Femita X. ArcX um, allows you to take requirements and test plans, trackers, and validation plans, and um, helps you with doing FAMIAs, HAZOPS, DFAs, cyber threat analysis. And then uh, FAMIDA uh, provides you with failure rates, failure modes, or FAMIDA X, diagnostic coverage, and other useful information. So let's start on our topic today, which is uh, I'm going to start with the 62443 introduction, like I said, at a 10,000 foot level. So we'll get into some of the concepts, but I'm not going to get into great detail because it's a very um, detailed standard. Basically, the 62443 describes a way of looking for and mitigating security bugs that exist in uh, industrial automation and control systems, uh, which of course, as we all probably know, are control systems such as manufacturing, oil and gas, uh, power, et cetera. So that's opposed, as opposed to uh, information technology systems, which are more like what is your at your banking uh, centers or financial centers um, or at universities and so forth. So we're interested in failures and failures causing some sort of hazard or uh, loss of life. So our security criteria for 62443, um, it has some fundamental criteria that it uses um, as its basis for existence. And um, that's basically the idea of security is uh, to control access and use, um, to worry about integrity and confidentiality of the data. In other words, is the data been uh, tampered with um, and is it kept confidential when it needs to be? Uh, it talks about how well, the requirements want you to restrict the flow of data so that they're only used by entities that are supposed to be using the, the data, um, that you know you secure the data both uh, in movement and at rest. Um, we want to re respond to security events in a timely manner. So if there's a bug, we want to know about the bug. If um, you know there's patches available, we want to know uh, that they are available and um, when and if they can be applied to our particular situation. And we're also worried about availability of resources. Um, make sure that we have the right um, devices in place to help with the security context. Make sure that as we um, take in and develop our product, and then we put it into the field that we keep the security levels that we're expecting. <clears throat> if we talk about some of the fundamental requirements here, um, there's a number of specifications that actually make up the 62443 um, cybersecurity spec specification. And they concentrate on the different parts of the industrial automation and control system and the development life cycle. And on the next page, I'll show you that um, layout and we'll go over that shortly. Um, each of the different specifications apply criteria based on the scope of the specification. So as you'll see, when we're talking about things that have to do with um, system stuff, it, the specifications will be system related. If they're dealing with components, they'll be component um, driven. So this process then creates derived requirements for each of these sub standards and um, they're described in each of the different specifications. 
here's the uh, standards organization. So at the top, what we have is basically our general overview. It's the um, one series, the 62443 one series. So it talks about terminology, concepts, and the general idea of what the models are that are discussed and, uh, and have derived requirements in the other standards. Um, we have the glossary of terms and, and uh, abbreviations and uh, compliance metrics. We also have uh, a set, the two series, which talk about policies and procedures for what you're, like if you're establishing in an IACS security program, what are your policies and procedure requirements? And if you're operating one, what kinds of requirements are you need, you know, do you need to satisfy to operate one um, from a security point of view? How do you handle patch management in the environment? Um, and also service providers, how do they deal with cybersecurity? So that's your uh, two series for policies and procedures. In the system, which is a three series, um, this is now where you're actually talking about the system that is being um, delivered or being implemented. So here we're talking about what security technologies are you going to use in your system, um, how you're going to lay out what's called zones and conduits, which is basically how you're partitioning your system to keep the flow of information contained to where it's going to be, keep track of authorization, keep track of um, authentication, um, and those kinds of issues and then there's uh, also the requirements for assurance levels to make sure that you're meeting the particular security levels that you want to meet and that you are moving forward in a way that keeps your system secure um, and then finally we have the component level which is actually what we're going to be discussing because that is the one that is directly relevant for um, software development, hardware development, product development things. Um, and in this case, that's the four series. So we have 4-1, which is the product development lifecycle requirements. So essentially, this is your security development lifecycle requirements. Um, and then 4-2, which is the requirements that are applied directly to the device itself. So in other words, what security requirements are required in a particular device. So again, to reiterate, since Agile is basically about software development, the consideration here under today's discussion is given to basically 4-1, which is the development lifecycle process used to actually create the products within your organization, and the 4-2, which is the cybersecurity requirements of the product itself. So we have both the lifecycle and the management under 4-1, and we have 4-2, which are the cybersecurity requirements of the product. One of the things that 62443 brings out are the idea of security levels. Um, there's five security levels, and we'll talk about those on the next page a little bit, but um, each level basically needs more security in place to thwart increasingly dangerous threats. Um, and the product developers need to be aware of what security level is required by the definition of the product. Um, different decisions will be made, be made depending on what security level you're shooting for. Um, security level is important because the higher the security level, the more development effort, the more uh, resources, the more time and the more money need to be spent in order to make those uh, security levels. So you need to um, target the correct security level for the correct security context that you're going to be creating a device for or you're going to be creating um, you know a component of a system so you want to make sure that's understood so if we talk about those a little bit we can see that there's um, basically I said five levels SL0 is basically no uh, cybersecurity requirements so we, we don't even put that on the table here um, security level one which is basically what we're trying to do is deal with the casual person who makes a mistake and they you know they're um, at a command line in Linux or something like that and and they inadvertently type remove R M minus F star or something you know goofy like that you know they didn't really mean to um, have a um, the security issue generated by them doing their job, but they inadvertently did. So the security level one 
deals with uh, they're not really actively searching on trying to attack the system. They kind of have a low sophistication. They're just kind of a generic user. They don't really have any resources other than what's available on the system itself already. Um, their skill level, eh, they're kind of generic skill level and they really have no motivation to be doing anything incorrect to the system. So a security level one is basically um, to attempt, you know, to put into good practices um, how to, you know, handle the casual mistake from a casual user. Security level two is kind of more the script level, uh, you know, script kitty level of um, attacker here. Um, they're actively trying to interact with your system. They're trying, you know, their sophistication is kind of medium. They don't have many resources, but they do have some. Their skill level is not industrial automation control system specific, um, but they have, uh, you know, a low kind of motivation as well. So this is, you know, your generic skip script kitty on the uh, internet trying to attack your web server if you happen to have one in your uh, device or in your system and they're just running port scans and that kind of thing so that's security level two security level three is essentially a determined professional kind of person that um, is trying to get to your system they are actively trying to get in they're fairly highly sophisticated they have a moderate amount of resources. It's not unlimited, but they, they're they more on the cutting edge of what's going on or understand more what's on the cutting edge. They do have um, specific knowledge of your industrial automation control systems. So they may know, you know, if you are uh, got Rockwell devices, they may know uh, information about Rockwell devices. They may know information about your Honeywell devices. Um, and their motivation's high. They may be trying to disrupt the system, um, you know, they could be looking for, um, uh, you know, even uh, corporate guidance um, or, uh, you know, something along those lines where they're, they're actually trying to get information about your system to use in other systems. So this is kind of your determined professional. And then security level four is essentially your nation state. So this is your Russia, your China, the US. It's actively searching, they're very sophisticated, a high level of resources, basically unlimited number of resources. They know a lot about the industrial automation and control systems and their motivation is very high. So these are the nation state actors um, is what most people call them. So if we look at the 4-2 development process guidance, again, what is that? That's That has to do with the devices themselves. Um, we're talking about development of the devices have to adhere to some of the uh, development lifecycle requirements. Um, when you're designing it and architecting it, the concept of least privilege should be used. Again, these are some 10,000 foot rules of thumb that uh, the 4-2 is giving you. Um, least privilege, in other words, you know, if I have an operator that's working on the system, he shouldn't have, or he or she shouldn't have the same um, capabilities as an engineer working on the system. Or, uh, you know, a um, auditor that's only auditing your logs should not have the same um, authorization or access as uh, the operator, for instance. Um, least privilege also um, comes into play with devices themselves on the system. So if you have a component that you're designing within the system, you shouldn't give that component any more functionality than is actually needed for the component to do its job. You know, uh, you don't want a component that's supposed to be calculating a recipe value to be generating website information. Uh, you know, you need to s separate those things out. Um, and uh, it also mentions, 4-2 mentions, that you may have to have compensating countermeasures um, that are external to the component being developed. And what that means is that I may be developing a component that has a web server in it, um, but I don't have a firewall built into my component. I need an external firewall. Uh, that may be a compensating countermeasure based on your threat modeling that, uh, you know, is required in order to put the product into the security context of the system. And uh, that, you know, is, is taken into consideration in the 4-2 uh, 
set of requirements. In 4-1, which again is the process as opposed to the product or a device, um, we have some practices that um, are high level practices that are um, stated in requirements, fundamental requirements and so forth. So um, the derived requirements for 4.1 are essentially considering security management. In other words, security related activities planned and followed through the life cycle. We have to ensure that security requirements are documents. That's the security requirements section. The secure by design sections talk about, um, you know, defense in depth, least privilege, you know, making sure that you have banned functions, uh, things that have to do with uh, design and implementation, make sure that the implementation of the product features are secure so that, you know, you worry about buffer overflows, input issues, SQL injection attacks, so forth and so on. To continue, the, the uh, 4-1 also talks about security verification and validation testing and that you need to have documentation that the required security testing has taken place. Um, we also need to manage our security related issues. In other words, we get bugs that turn out to be security related. How do we deal with the bugs? Um, how do we handle, uh, you know, determining the risk? How do we handle um, determining when to implement things, um, how to solve mitigations. We then also want to know security update management, which is, okay, now we've got bugs. How do we distribute our fixes to our customers and our internal, you know, use uh, going forward? So, you know, who determines the risk updates, who determines whether they need to be fixed or not fixed? That also comes under security update management guidelines. And then we also have the security guidelines for um, uh, the, the device or security guidelines for actually implementing and putting into the field your device. So in other words, we want user documentation. How do we actually install it? How do we use it in a secure way? How do we decommission it in a secure way? Um, you know, how does it fit into the entire system and what needs to be around it in order to make it to the security level that you're trying to be capable of? So that's uh, included in there. So essentially, that was uh, you know a 10,000 foot overview of 62.443, um, especially 4.1 and 4.2 that we're going to you know use as as we go forward here for today. Um, next, I'll go over Agile. Um, just a quick intro, and again, this is an intro more with um, Scrum as the framework for Agile because a lot of people seem to use it. So Agile basically is an idea, set of ideas and principles um, to help attempt to better develop software. Uh, the Agile Manifesto, which I put on the next page, is basically the genesis of the different Agile frameworks. Um, so there's many different frameworks, many different ways to interpret this manifesto. Um, and, you know, Scrum happens to be one. Um, that, you know, I'll use this as an example here. Um, basically, it's these four bullet points that are interesting. The individuals and interactions are valued over process and tools. Working software valued over comprehensive documentation. This is something you should remember there, comprehensive documentation. Customer collaboration is valued over contract negotiation and responding to change valued over following a plan. Now notice none, nowhere in there does it say there is no documentation. It doesn't say there are no tools used. It doesn't say there are no plans. It merely says that if it's possible to create walk, working software without having to do comprehensive or non-useful documentation, then you should do that. However, if you're required to do it, then you're required to do the documentation. So, and for 443, it is documentation, I don't want to say heavy, but documentation is is very big part of it. Um, again, just to reiterate here, um, it doesn't say there's no documentation, no process, no artifacts. It just says they're not valued as much as the things on the left side. They're still valued, and especially when they're actually required by whatever process you are using. 62443 in our case. 
So again, why is it important? It's based on a repeatable documented development process that can be shown to be he adhered to for a particular product. That means, you know, whenever we go back and we assess it and try and do a certification on the product, we'll need to see that, you know, bugs have been handled to completion, that they've been signed off correctly, that the different, you know, testing has been done in a way that's um, correct and so forth. So um, the assumption of the standard, the 62443 standard, is that if you follow this process that the standard lays out and the requirements for your device, then it'll produce a product that meets your security risk levels. So, you know, again, we, we talked about the security levels and those deal with risk as well as some other uh, things, which I'm not going to go into today. But essentially, if you follow the process, the way that it's laid out, the pro the uh, 62443 is saying you should come up with a product that meets your required cybersecurity risk levels. Now, that's, of course, not saying there are no bugs, that there aren't security issues. It's merely saying that, in general, you should come up one, with one that's very um, close to it. So if we look at our Scrum overview, probably everybody's seen this picture a million times. Um, we have a product backlog that the product owner who talks with your stakeholders puts in stories and, and uh, so forth and so on. Um, you have a development team of which all the members are interchangeable and they forecast the work during sprint planning. They plan their work. They come up with a set of backlogs that um, they'll use throughout the sprint and they start the sprint. And every day they have a daily meeting, a daily scrum, decide, you know, what was done yesterday, what do we plan on doing today, are there any blockages, you know, that kind of thing, any really major changes that need to be worried about. Uh, then we go in and we, you know, start working on the backlog, we make changes to it, update things, um, may have to add things into the backlog, even though we've taken them out, you know, different People have different ways of whether they allow that, don't allow that, how that interprets and gets handled. So we're not going to worry about that. Um, then eventually this, the sprint is over and, and we've declared done. We had decided what done is. Um, we come up with a releasable increment and we uh, basically release and we say, you know, here's, a, here's our product release. And then we do a review of the sprint and then eventually we do a review of the entire sprint retrospective so we're looking at our our entire sprint planning and so forth and considering changes to be made to it um, now the scrum if you remember if you look at that picture there's a whole bunch of activities that go on actually that are not explicitly brought out there so what i did was i have made those activities clearer by putting them into a um, poster-like format, um, and we'll start looking at those. The reason this is important is uh, because you'll see that um, when I incorporate the 62443 requirements in, that it kind of maps to the same overall structure. It just adds some detail to it. But we'll look at each of these parts individually. But if you just look at the overview, you'll see that on the left, we've got the product um, and the planning um, phase. We got sprint planning. We got our daily scrum. We got daily work that's done. We got our sprint review, sprint retrospective, and those are the things that we run through in our um, scrum, scrum life cycle for the sprint. If we look at the product planning um, here, you'll see that uh, um, we're doing design and document of the processes for general development. In other words, we are trying to figure out what compilers we have. We're trying to figure out what our linker scripts you know, what our memory maps look like. We're trying to de decide how we're going to um, deliver code. We're going to decide how we're going to handle um, version control, et cetera, et cetera. So there is planning that goes on and um, needs to be captured in some kind of documentation. So that's not new. Um, again, here's some activities that are done every day when people are working. They've got requirements you got you pull a story out you know um, you look at the requirements of the story how applicable is it to what I'm working on today uh, do I need to do any documentation for the for the, the story I need to review it 
I need to review with other people. I might need to interact with people to decide, you know, I'm changing, I have to change this particular function and you need this function. How are we going to deal with that? Um, we have design goals that we look at every, you know, time we're working. Um, what are our be current best practices that our group is using? What is our architecture? You know, is, are, are any of these things that we're working on going to change the architecture? Do they invalidate parts of the architecture? What about performance? I'm worried about, you know, uh, do I, you know, I'm, I'm implementing this feature. How, how am I going to implement this in a way that's going to be a good performance feature? Um, or can I get away with bad performance because in reality it doesn't matter for this particular feature? What other kind of constraints do I have? Maybe I have a constraint with my compiler, a strength, constraint with memory, constraints with numbers of users, et cetera. So I'm, I'm worried about this, you know, every time I, I do some work. Same thing with interfaces. Here we're, we're worried about, in general, the design of the interface. How good is the interface? How well does it map to the functionality of a particular um, section of code that I'm working on? Do I need to increase the interface, you know, make it bigger? Uh, do I need to, to make it smaller and more, more refined? Um, how do I make sure that I don't introduce any regression into my interface implementation? You know, all of a sudden, I, now I got to go and change 100 places where I used to have two arguments and now I only want one. I need to think about those. Um, my development environment in general, how usable is it? You know, how, how good is my tool set? How's my compiler working? What compiler switches am I using? Um, you know, uh, how's my uh, IDE working? Is it working? Then I need to worry about encryption. Do I need any encryption? If I'm using encryption, how do I deal with the keys? Uh, you know, am I, you know, who has them? Who's allowed to change them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Third-party components, a lot of people use those. So we end up with, um, you know, how do I actually use them in my system? What's my licensing? You know, can I use them, et cetera. Uh, implementation, here I am, you know, every day worrying about static, you know, uh, doing my implementation goals. So I want to run static code analysis continually. I'm sure the group has coding standards, so I need to constantly be uh, thinking about the coding standards. Uh, review with other people if we find that there's a lot of issues with uh, static code analysis, finding uh, bugs and things like that, you know, or possible bugs. I'm doing Mostly testing, continuous kinds of testing, um, you know, both the unit testing or uh, uh, functional testing or boundary testing of inputs or uh, APIs, that kind of thing. I'm also worried about doneness. Again, we, we have to define what done is for a particular sprint. So as a group, we got to define that. We got to decide whether we're adhering to it. Um, we come up with bugs. We got to figure out how we're going to address them. How do we close them? How do we communicate with other people that uh, we need to um, really consider changing, you know, their parts of the code and how we merge in, you know, bug fixes and so forth. And then we worry about product release. You know, how are we packaging the files together that are needed for the for the product? Um, what kinds of user manual updates are needed, if any? You know, uh, if all of a sudden, you know, there's a new command for the user, how do we how do we actually update? you know, the product documentation for that. We're worried about file integrity, you know, we don't want to mess up our uh, our delivery for, uh, you know, for uh, delivering the actual product. How do we make sure that that doesn't get messed up? So we need to consider all of these things all at the same time, all as we're doing our work for uh, the particular day. Um, and then once, you know, we get done with the sprint, and we have the sprint review of what the development is, then we have a sprint retrospective of uh, how we might improve that process that we just um, were using. In other words, we're looking actually at the activities and deciding do we need to add more activities, do we need to look into an activity in more detail and try and flesh it out a little more, can we skimp a little more um, on one activity because it's not really being used by a lot of people or, you know, that particular development idea isn't being used, that kind of thing. Now, let's see. Okay, so we went through all the activities. We kind of had a framework for the Scrum that is more detailed than you usually see because it actually brings out those activities that are being done all the time. So now if we're looking at the 62443, we, we add more activities. 
we don't change the um, overall architecture of the Scrum process, but we do now have to add activities to it that are security related, and we need to explicitly consider security. You notice when I was talking about it before, we weren't explicitly talking about security. We may have been thinking about it in the back of our heads or doing it in an ad hoc way, um, but not as an explicit activity. So as pointed out before, there's different security-based requirements that need to be incorporated into our Scrum development process. Um, one of the main issues is that 62443 requires that security testing personnel are independent of the teams doing development. Um, and the problem is that Scrum requires there's no differentiation between team members. Now that almost never really happens. There's always somebody who's the architect person in the group, and there's somebody who's the, you know, the person who's the, the implementer guy or, or lady in the group. Um, but um, Scrum itself, if you follow, adhere to the process, states that there's absolutely no differentiation. 62.443 requires a differentiation. So that's one of the main um, points that has to be um, addressed, which we'll do a little bit later. Um, but again, if we think about what we went through for the activities uh, before for Scrum and the activities that might be needed for 62.443, we find out that there's basically three categories. We have Scrum Agile development requirements that are not security or 62443 related. We have ones that are specifically 62443 only requirements. And then we have those requirements that actually end up being shared. In other words, you know, um, and we'll see that here, uh, when we're talking about design, you know, we, we were talking about, you know, best practices, right? Well, there's best practices in the industry, not security related and there's best practices for security related uh, things so when you combine them together you now get the best of both worlds you get the you know the standard security um, practices and you get the standard industry non-security practices so we want to merge them together into a unified development process and we need to carefully consider the security testing because of this 62443 requirement um, and again, just to reiterate, Scrum requires no differentiation, and 62443 requires differentiation. And the reason is because they want to ensure that there aren't some implicit assumptions or prejudices by the security testers that might impact the results. In other words, you know, if I implement something, I might be like, ah, I know I can't put in 5K into here, so I'll only use a, a string length of 20. Well, you know, the security tester that doesn't know is going to put in a 5K uh, string into there and see what happens. So, and these are things that you may not consciously do, but unconsciously, you know, you may not do a test that you unconsciously realize is, is going to cause a problem, whereas you really want to do that test. So what does this mean? How can we resolve this issue? Well, then we just need to borrow security testers from other teams, um, generally under a different manager. Um, and then that will essentially allow us to um, meet the 62.443 testing requirement. Um, going forward here, what I'm going to do is show the following diagram. It's going to show the merge procedures, like I said, the three parts there. Um, and there's three different development requirement categories, and I've kind of uh, denoted them this way. The black italic ones are the non-security ones. The red ones are security specific. And the bold red ones are both security and non-security considerations. So um, as we go into the next section, we'll talk about that. So essentially what I'm going to come up with here is a process where the Scrum Light 62443 process is expanded. All of those activities that we talked about in the Scrum process have been expanded um, to cover you know, both the non-security and the security related activities. So if we just take a quick overview, we see this: the boxes on the left are the same, product planning, sprint planning, scrum, daily work, sprint review, sprint retrospective. But you notice that there's a lot of red there. Now it might look like that's all security related, but it's not. You'll see there's a lot of red bold stuff 
um, that is, again, a combination of the security and the non-security. So it's not as bad as it looks. It just, you know, is uh, red because you are going to explicitly consider security. So, so let's start here. Um, again, for 2, 62443, um, 4-1, you know, there's the different um, groupings that we consider management, security management requirements, security requirement requirements, secure by design requirements, secure implementation requirements, secure verification and validation, defect management, which it bugs, security update management, which is patching, and security guidelines, which is, you know, how do we document how to use the system in a secure way and how do we put it into the system securely. So if we look at our product planning phase before, what we had was only one thing that we were really considering. We were considering the general development processes that we were going to use, you know, our compilers, our linkers, our, our scripts, and so forth and so on, um, you know, how we do the delivery and that kind of thing. Well, you know, 62443 now requires us to add some things that are specifically related to security and that we need to explicitly consider, and that is what exactly is the process for uh, security-related development. And uh, behind that, you'll see SM. Uh, so if you were looking at the standard, you would see security management uh, section one um, and security management section five um, discuss the um, requirements for um, security-related development specifically. I'm not going to go into those. They're, they're way too detailed. That's either for another webinar or white paper or something like that. So. Um, then we have security roles and responsibilities. So again, the uh, Scrum says there's no differentiation. Um, 62443 says that the testers have to be independent, but it does require you to at least provide roles and responsibilities and have people that are, um, you know, responsible for those roles and respond that that take part in a role and then have responsibilities, and that's to make sure nothing falls through the cracks. Um, we also need to document a process that reviews, identifies, handles, discloses any security-related issues. So we need to consider that before we start. And again, you want to scope it to how your, you know, what your people are, how good they are, how much they already know of security, and so forth and so on. So, and those um, sections will help you um, help you determine what you need to do. And again, these also have to do with levels. So here we get to our daily work stuff. Again, requirements, applicability, we already said we have to worry about a applicability of the requirements to our particular stories or what we're working on today. Um, the reason it's bold and red here is because a security management section three um, spe specifically mentions that you have to decide if a feature is security related or impact security in any way. So you need to explicitly consider that. Um, documentation, the same thing. If you have something that's security related, then you must document it in, in certain ways. So that's a requirement now to bring forth security. Same thing with reviews. You know, if you have something that's security uh, related that you're changing or impact security, you need to make sure you review it with people to make sure everybody is on the same page. So again, uh, you're not doing anything different in the sense that you're not doing a, a new activity. You're merely explicitly expanding your activity. And then we have design goals, best practices, and there's a number of uh, things dealing with, you know, defense and depth and uh, things which is explicitly brought out here, but uh, other kinds of best practices that incorporate security-related uh, effective practices. Um, we also need to worry about security reviews. Interfaces, again, interfaces from the point of view of design. How do we make sure we consider security doing the design of the interfaces? How do we make sure we don't um, introduce regressions that are security regressions? I mean, the interface itself may be functionally correct, but allows for um, uh, a particular security level threat that we are not supposed to allow. In other words, if we we're trying to go for a, you know, a level three, um, and we inadvertently uh, don't do a, a validation of the input, that you know immediately is is a problem. Um, we also need to do something that we haven't been required to do, 
so far, which is a threat model. So we actually need to consider um, a threat model for the system, look at the data flows, data stores, uh, when the things cross threat boundaries and so forth. So that's something new that has to be done. Um, development environment, we had the usability before, now we gotta worry about the integrity. So we explicitly need to make sure that all of our tools are the right versions, our compiler flags are the correct flags, um, the integrity of the development tools themselves hasn't, hasn't been compromised. Um, so again, we need to consider this on a daily basis. Um, for encryption, not only whether it's in necessary, and, and we talked about key management before, but now explicit you know, consideration of key management. Is it in, stored in hardware? Is it stored in a read-only? Is it stored where it's not in clear text? Those kinds of things are, are key management issues. Third party components, we need to worry about using it, but we also need to worry about security and how it interacts from a third party component. Um, how do we deal with um, patches that are needed to the third party component? How does that affect our patching and that kind of thing? Implementation goals, again, static code analysis. Um, 62.443 requires certain band function lists and so forth and so on that you may not actually have, um, but your static code now has to take that into account. We need coding standards, even if you were just kind of ad hocing them, you know, now you need to actually um, get um, some of those written down. Same thing with reviews. Testing, we still the continuous, the functional, the boundary, but now we have to actually do fuzz testing. Um, fuzz testing is, you know, putting in junk into um, various inputs and seeing what happens. We do need to do threat mitigation. So if we have threats, we need to make sure we mitigate them. You know, we found threats in that threat model. We need to worry about vulnerability testing. We need to do some penetration testing. Um, we need to worry about updates when we are doing testing. And this big one is the tester independence, which we've already covered. And again, we're not doing a whole lot different than you probably really are doing. It's just that now they're being explicitly done and they need to be explicitly documented that uh, they've actually been done so that um, there's a traceability that we can go back and look at and say, yes, you did adhere to the process. Um, then there's a the definition of doneness, right? You know, what's the definition of done? We gotta worry about bugs, but we also need to worry about security issues themselves. They may be bugs, they may be updates to uh, the manuals, they may be a security context uh, change, that kind of thing. Um, product release, now we also need to worry more about file integrity, how do we make sure that it's authentic and, and, uh, and the integrity is good. Um, we need to worry about security documentation, you know, uh, again, now we need to explicitly give the customer the documentation that allows them to use it in their system in a secure manner and uh, that they don't introduce new problems and that way that you're making a uh, device at a particular security level capability when they put it into the system that it actually becomes that security level. And if we look at the final part here we see that you know we need to review and improve not only the scum the scrum process, but the security development life cycle itself. So we also want to consider how it is that we are dealing with all of these security issues and we wanna make sure that um, if there's any enhancements that we can do that we make those enhancements and there may be some things that we're going overboard on um, and then you can dial them back. You know, um, it's not that, uh, again, you, you don't wanna go for security level four, you know, because it costs time, money, materials, resources. You know, you want to basically optimize your security for your security level requirement that um, the um, particular uh, device has as its requirement. And so in summary, uh, yeah, it is possible to, uh, to take a Agile and in particular Scrum and incorporate 62443. Uh, the things you really need to you know, look at are that you need to consider security explicitly. Um, the security testers need to be independent, you know, borrow them from other teams, uh, really from other groups on a, without the same first line manager is the, the best way to do it. And 62443 actually has some requirements where some testing can be done by individuals that aren't the, the developers and others are required to 
to actually come from a different first line level manager. Um, so, but that's details. And then the documentation does need to be done. There needs to be traceability, needs to be documented. You can use, you know, spreadsheets, uh, Word documents, uh, JAMA, uh, doors, whatever it is you're using, um, but it does need to be done. But you can keep it to the essentials. Um, you can consider that in your security process to determine what the essentials are. And then uh, when you want to be certified to it, then we can come and look. And then we use that documentation to go back and uh, do the assessment and then give you a certification. So I think that is it for, um, for the uh, 62443 and uh, Scrum, so I appreciate you listening. Um, I have a couple of more slides here talking about some other upcoming classes and things that we provide. Um, I didn't see any questions, so I'm assuming that there aren't any questions, that um, but that's good. Here's some classes. If uh, we also have some other self-paced training that's available online that you can sign up for and uh, and take these classes online as opposed to uh, go into a class in person. Um, and if you want to know more, we have our Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn information here. Uh, for me, again, um, it's jdavis at exeda.com. Um, if you have any questions, send me an email. I'll try and respond. If I can't figure the answer out, I'll find somebody who can. And I appreciate everybody taking the time to uh, listen to the webinar. Thank you very much. Talk to you later.